Act Three of Hamlet by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One A Room in the Castle. Enter King Claudius, Queen Gertrude, Polonius, Ophelia, Rosencrantz, and Guildenstern. And can you, by no drift of circumstance, get from him why he puts on this confusion, grating so harshly all his days of quiet with turbulent and dangerous lunacy? He does confess himself distracted, but from what cause he will by no means speak. Nor do we find him forward to be sounded, but with a crafty madness keeps aloof when we would bring him on to some confession of his true state did he receive you well boast like a gentleman but with much forcing of his disposition did you assay him to any pastime madam it so fell out that certain players we all wrought on the way of this we told him and there did seem in him a kind of joy to hear it they are about the court and as i think they have already ordered this knight to play before him tis most true and he beseech me to entreat your majesties to hear and see the matter with all my heart and it doth much content me to hear him so inclined good gentlemen give him a further edge and drive his purpose on to these delights we shall my lord exeunt rosencrantz and guildenstern sweet gertrude leave us two for we have closely sent for Hamlet hither, that he, as twere by accident, may hear of Frontophilia. Her father and myself, lawful espials, will so bestow ourselves, that seeing unseen we may of their encounter frankly judge, and gather by him, as he is behaved, if it be the affliction of his love or no, that thus he suffers for. I shall obey you. And for your part, Ophelia, I do wish that your good beauties be the happy cause of Hamlet's wildness. So shall I hope your virtues will bring him to his wonted way again, to both your honours. Madame, I wish it may. Exit Queen Gertrude. Ophelia, walk you here. Gracious, so please you, we will bestow ourselves. To Ophelia. Read on this book, that show of such an exercise may colour your loneliness. We are oft to blame in this. Tis too much proved that with devotion's visage and pious action we do sugar o'er the devil himself. Aside. Oh, tis too true. How smart a lash that speech doth give my conscience! The harlot's cheek, beautied with plastering art, is not more ugly to the thing that helps it than is my deed to my most painted word. Oh, heavy burden! I hear him coming. Let's withdraw, my lord. Exeunt King Claudius and Polonius. Enter Hamlet. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing, end them. To die, to sleep, no more, and by a sleep to say we end the heartache, and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die, to sleep, to sleep perchance to dream, ay, there's the rub, for in that sleep of death what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life, for who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes? when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin. Who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country, from whose bore no traveller returns, puzzles the will, 
and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus conscience does make cowards of us all, and thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied o'er with the pale cast of thought, and enterprises of great pith and moment with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Soft you now, the fair Ophelia. Nymph, in thy orisons be all my sins remembered. Good my lord, how does your honour for this many a day? I humbly thank you. Well, well, well. My lord, I have remembrances of yours that I have longed, longed to re-deliver. I pray you, now receive them. No, not I. I never gave you aught. My honoured lord, you know right well you did, and with them words of so sweet breath composed, as made the things more rich, their perfume lost. Take these again, for to the noble mind rich gifts wax poor when givers prove unkind. There, my lord. <laughs> Are you honest? My lord? Are you fair? What means your lordship? That if you be honest and fair, your honesty should admit no discourse to your beauty. Could beauty, my lord, have better commerce than with honesty? Ay, truly, for the power of beauty will sooner transform honesty from what it is to a bawd than the force of honesty can translate beauty into his likeness. This was sometime a paradox, but now the time gives it proof. I did love you once. Indeed, my lord, you made me believe so. You should not have believed me, for virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock but we shall relish of it. I loved you not. I was the more deceived. Get thee to a nunnery. Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? I am myself indifferent honest, but yet I could accuse me of such things that it were better my mother had not borne me. I am very proud, revengeful, ambitious, with more offences at my back than I have thoughts to put them in, imagination to give them shape or time to act them in. What should such fellows as I do crawling between earth and heaven? We are errant knaves all. Believe none of us. Go thy ways to a nunnery. Where's your father? At home, my lord. Let the doors be shut upon him, that he may play the fool nowhere but in his own house. Farewell. Oh, help him, you sweet heavens! If thou dost, Mary, I'll give thee this plague for thy dowry. Be thou as chaste as ice, as pure as snow, thou shalt not escape calumny. Get thee to a nunnery, go, farewell. Or, if thou wilt needs marry, marry a fool, for wise men know well enough what monsters you make of them. To a nunnery, go, and quickly too, farewell. O oh, heavenly powers, restore him! I have heard of your paintings too well enough. God has given you one face, and you make yourselves another. You jig, you amble, and you lisp, and nickname God's creatures, and make your wantonness your ignorance. Go to, I'll know more on't. It hath made me mad. I say we will have no more marriages. Those that are married already, all but one, shall live. The rest shall keep as they are. To a nunnery. Go. Exit. Oh, what a noble mind is here overthrown! The courtiers, soldiers, scholars, eye, tongue, sword, the expectancy and rose of the fair state, the glass of fashion and the mould of form, the observed of all observers, quite, quite down, and I of ladies most deject and wretched, that sucked the honey of his music vows, now see that noble and most sovereign reason, like sweet bells jangled, out of tune and harsh, that unmatched form and feature of blown youth, blasted with ecstasy. Oh, woe is me! To have seen what I have seen, see what I see. Re-enter King Claudius and Polonius. Love! His affections do not that way tend. Nor what he spake, though it lacked form a little, was not like madness. There's something in his soul o'er which his melancholy sits on brood. And I do doubt the hatch and the disclose will be some danger. Which, for to prevent, I have in quick determination thus set it down. 
he shall with speed to England, for the demand of our neglected tribute. Haply the seas and countries different with variable objects shall expel this something settled matter in his heart, whereon his brain still beating puts him thus from fashion of himself. What think you want? It shall do well, yet do I believe the origin and commencement of his grief sprung from neglected love. How now, Ophelia? You need not tell us what Lord Hamlet said. We heard it all. My lord, do as you please, but if you hold it fit, after the play, let his queen mother all alone entreat him to show his grief. Let her be round with him, and I'll be placed, so please you, in the air of all their conference. If she find him not, to England send him, or confine him where your wisdom best shall think. It shall be so. Madness in great ones must not unwatched go. Exeunt. Scene two. A hall in the castle. Enter Hamlet and players. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it as many of your players do, I had as lief the town crier spoke my lines. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand thus, but use all gently. For in the very torrent, tempest, and, as I may say, the whirlwind of passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Oh, it offends me to the soul to hear a robustious, periwig-pated fellow tear a passion to tatters, to very rags, to split the ears of the groundlings, who for the most part are capable of nothing but inexplicable dumb shows and noise. I would have such a fellow whipped for or doing termagant. It out Herod's Herod. Pray you, avoid it. I warrant your honour. Be not too tame neither, but let your own discretion be your tutor. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action, with this special observance, that you o'erstep not the modesty of nature. For anything so overdone is from the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and now, was and is to hold as twere the mirror up to nature to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time his form and pressure. Now this overdone, or come tardy off, though it make the unskilful laugh, cannot but make the judicious grieve. The censure of the which one must in your allowance or weigh a whole theatre of others. Oh, there be players that I have seen play, and heard others praise, and that highly, not to speak it profanely, that— neither having the accent of Christians nor the gait of Christian, pagan, nor man, have so strutted and bellowed that I have thought some of nature's journeymen had made men and not made them well. They imitated humanity so abominably. I hope we have reformed that indifferently with us, sir. Oh, reform it altogether. And let those that play your clowns speak no more than is set down for them. For there be of them that will themselves laugh to set on some quantity of barren spectators to laugh too, though in the meantime some necessary question of the play be then to be considered. That's villainous, and shows a most pitiful ambition in the fool that uses it. Go, make you ready. Exeunt players. Enter Polonius, Rosencrantz, and Guildenstern. How now, my lord? Will the king hear this piece of work? And the queen, too and that presently bid the players make haste exit polonius will you two help to hasten them we will my lord exeunt rosencrantz and guildenstern what ho horatio enter horatio here sweet lord at your service horatio thou art e'en as just a man as e'er my conversation coped with all oh my dear lord nay do not think i flatter for what advancement may I hope from thee, that no revenue hast but thy good spirits to feed and clothe thee? Why should the poor be flattered? No, let the candied tongue lick absurd pomp, and crook the pregnant hinges of the knee where thrift may follow fawning. Dost thou hear? Since my dear soul was mistress of her choice, and could of men distinguish, her election hath sealed thee for herself. For thou hast been as one in suffering all that suffers nothing, a man that fortune's buffets and rewards hast ta'en with equal thanks, 
and blessed are those whose blood and judgment are so well commingled that they are not a pipe for fortune's finger to sound what stop she please. Give me that man that is not passion's slave, and I will wear him in my heart's core, I, in my heart of heart, as I do thee. Something too much of this. There is a play to-night before the king. One scene of it comes near the circumstance which I have told thee of my father's death. I prithee, when thou seest that act afoot, even with the very comment of thy soul, observe mine uncle. If his occulted guilt do not itself unkennel in one speech, it is a damned ghost that we have seen, and my imaginations are as foul as Vulcan's stithy. Give him a heedful note, for I mine eyes will rivet to his face, and after we will both our judgments join in censure of his seeming. Well, my lord. If he still ought, the whilst this play is playing, and scape detecting, I will pay the theft. They are coming to the play. I must be idle. Get you a place. Danish march, a flourish. Enter King Claudius, Queen Gertrude, Polonius, Ophelia, Rosencrantz, Guildenstern, and others. How fares our cousin Hamlet? Excellent, i' faith, of the chameleon's dish. I eat the air, promise crammed, you cannot feed capons so. I have nothing with this answer, Hamlet. These words are not mine. No, nor mine now. To Polonius. My lord, you played once i' the university, you say? That did I, my lord, and was accounted a good actor. What did you enact? I did enact Julius Caesar. I was killed in the capital. Brutus killed me. It was a brute part of him to kill so capital a calf there. Be the players ready. Ay, my lord, they stay upon your patience. Come hither, my dear Hamlet. Sit by me. No, good mother, here's metal more attractive. To King Claudius. Oh, ho! Do you mark that? Lady, shall I lie in your lap? No, my lord. I mean, my head upon your lap. Ay. My lord. Do you think I meant country matters? I think nothing, my lord. That's a fair thought to lie between maids' legs. What is, my lord? Nothing. You are merry, my lord. Who? I. I, my lord. Oh, God, you're only jig-maker. What should a man do but be merry? For look you, how cheerfully my mother looks, and my father died within these two hours. Nay. "'Tis twice two months, my lord. "'So long. "'Nay, then, let the devil wear black, "'for I'll have a suit of sables. "'Oh, heavens! "'Die two months ago, and not forgotten yet. "'Then there's hope a great man's memory "'may outlive his life half a year. "'But, by your lady, he must build churches, then, "'or else shall he suffer not thinking on "'with the hobby-horse, whose epitaph is, "'For oh, for oh, the hobby-horse is forgot.'" Hout boys play. The dumb show enters. Enter a king and a queen very lovingly, the queen embracing him and he her. She kneels and makes show of protestation unto him. He takes her up and declines his head upon her neck, lays him down upon a bank of flowers. She, seeing him asleep, leaves him. Anon comes in a fellow takes off his crown, kisses it, and pours poison in the king's ears, and exit. The queen returns, finds the king dead, and makes passionate action. The poisoner, with some two or three mutes, comes in again, seeming to lament with her. The dead body is carried away. The poisoner woos the queen with gifts. She seems loath and unwilling a while, but in the end accepts his love. Exeunt. What means this, my lord? Mary, this is meeching malico. It means mischief. Belike this show imports the argument of the play. Enter prologue. We shall know by this fellow. The players cannot keep counsel. They'll tell all. Will he tell us what the show meant? Ay, or any show that you'll show him. Be not you ashamed to show, he'll not shame to tell you what it means. You are not, you are not. All mark the play. For us, and for our tragedy, 
Here stooping to your clemency, we beg your hearing patiently. Exit. Is this a prologue or the posy of a ring? Tis brief, my lord. As woman's love. Enter two players, king and queen. Full thirty times hath Phoebus' cart gone round Neptune's salt wash and Tellus' orbid ground, and thirty dozen moons with borrowed sheen about the world have times twelve thirties been, since love our hearts and hymen did our hands unite commutual in most sacred bands. So many journeys may the sun and moon make us again count o'er ere love be done. But woe is me, you are so sick of late, so far from cheer and from your former state, that I distrust you. Yet, though I distrust, discomfort you, my lord, it nothing must. For women's fear and love holds quantity, in neither aught nor in extremity. Now what my love is, proof hath made you know, and as my love is size, my fear is so. Where love is great, the littlest doubts are fear. Where little fears grow great, great love grows there. Faith, I must leave thee, love, and shortly, too, My operant powers their functions leave to do, And thou shalt live in this fair world behind, Honoured, beloved, and haply one as kind For husband shalt thou. Oh, confound the rest! Such love must needs be treason in my breast. In second husband let me be accursed. None wed the second but who killed the first. Wormwood, wormwood. The instances that second marriage move are base respects of thrift, but none of love. A second time I kill my husband dead when second husband kisses me in bed. I do believe you think what now you speak. But what we do determine, oft we break. Purpose is but the slave to memory, Of violent birth, but poor validity, Which now, like fruit unripe, sticks on the tree, But fall unshaken, when they mellow be. Most necessary tis that we forget To pay ourselves what to ourselves is debt. What to ourselves in passion we propose, The passion ending, doth the purpose lose the violence of either grief or joy their own enactures with themselves destroy where joy most revels grief doth most lament grief joys joy grieves on slender accident this world is not for i nor tis not strange that even our loves should with our fortunes change for tis a question left us yet to prove whether love lead fortune, or else fortune love. The great man down, you mark his favourite flies. The poor advanced, makes friends of enemies, And hitherto doth love on fortune tend. For who not needs, shall never lack a friend. And who in want a hollow friend doth try, Directly seasons him his enemy. But orderly to end where I begun, our wills and fates do so contrary run, That our devices still are overthrown. Our thoughts are ours, their ends none of our own. So think thou wilt no second husband wed, But die thy thoughts when thy first lord is dead. Nor earth to me give food, nor heaven light. Sport and repose lock from me day and night. To desperation turn my trust and hope, An anchor's cheer in prison be my scope. Each opposite that blanks the face of joy, Meet what I would have well, and it destroy. Both here and hence pursue me lasting strife, If, once a widow, ever I be wife. If she should break it now, Tis deeply sworn, Sweet, leave me here a while. My spirits grow dull, and fain I would beguile the tedious day with sleep. Sleep, rock thy brain, and never come mischance between us twain. Exit. Madam, how like you this play? 
The lady protests too much, methinks. Oh, but she'll keep her word. Have you heard the argument? Is there no offence in it? No, no, they do but jest, poison in jest, no offence in the world. What do you call the play? The Mouse Trap. Mary, how? Tropically. This play is the image of a murder done in Vienna. Gonzago is the duke's name, his wife, Baptista. You shall see anon, tis a knavish piece of work. But what of that? Your majesty and we that have free souls, it touches us not. Let the galled jade wince. Our withers are unwrung. Enter Lucianus. This is one Lucianus, nephew to the king. You are as good as a chorus, my lord. I could interpret between you and your love if I could see the puppets dallying. You are keen, my lord. You are keen. It would cost you a groaning to take off my edge. Still better, and worse. So you must take your husbands. Begin, murderer. Pox, leave thy damnable faces and begin. Come, the croaking raven doth bellow for revenge. Thoughts black, hands apt, drugs fit and time agreeing. Confederate season, else no creature seeing. Thou mixture rank of midnight weeds collected, With hecate band thrice blasted, thrice infected. Thy natural magic and dire property, On wholesome life usurp immediately. Pours the poison into the sleeper's ears. He poisons him i' the garden for his estate. His name's Gonzago. The story is extant and written in choice Italian. You shall see anon how the murderer gets the love of Gonzago's wife. The king rises. What, frighted with false fire? How fares, my lord? Give all the play. Give me some light. Away. Lights, lights, lights. Exeunt all but Hamlet and Horatio. Why, let the stricken deer go weep, the heart ungalled play. For some must watch while some must sleep, so runs the world away. Would not this, sir, and a forest of feathers, if the rest of my fortunes turn Turk with me, with two provincial roses on my raised shoes, get me a fellowship and a cry of players, sir? Half a share. A whole one, I. For thou dost know, O Damon dear, this realm dismantled was of Jove himself, and now reigns here a very, very pajock. You might have rhymed. Oh, good Horatio, I'll take the ghost's word for a thousand pound. Didst perceive? Very well, my lord. Upon the talk of the poisoning. I did very well note him. Aha! Come, some music. Come, the recorders. For if the king like not the comedy, why then, belike, he likes it not, perdy. Come, some music. Re-enter Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Good, my lord. Vouchsafe me a word with you. Sir, a whole history. The king, sir. I, sir, what of him? Is in his retirement marvellous distempered with drink sir no my lord rather with choler your wisdom should show itself more richer to signify this to his doctor for for me to put him to his purgation would perhaps plunge him into far more choler good my lord put your discourse into some frame and start not so wildly from my affair i am tame sir pronounce the queen your mother in most great affliction of spirit hath sent me to you you are welcome nay good my lord this courtesy is not of the right breed if it shall please you to make me a wholesome answer i will do your mother's commandment if not your pardon and my return shall be the end of my business sir i cannot what my lord make you a wholesome answer my wits diseased but sir such answer as i can make you shall command or rather as you say my mother therefore no more but to the matter my mother you say then thus she says your behaviour hath struck her into amazement and admiration oh wonderful son that can so astonish a mother but is there no sequel at the heels of this mother's admiration in part she desires to speak with you in our closet ere you go to bed we shall obey, were she ten times our mother. Have you any further trade with us? My lord, you once did love me. So I do still, by these pickers and stealers. Good my lord, what is your cause of distemper? You do surely bar the door upon your own liberty, if you deny your griefs to your friend. Sir, I lack advancement. 
How can that be, when you have the voice of the king himself for your succession in Denmark? Ay, but, sir, while the grass grows, the proverb is something musty. Re-enter players with recorders. Oh, the recorders, let me see one. To withdraw with you, why do you go about to recover the wind of me, as if you would drive me into a toil? Oh, my lord, if my duty be too bold, my love is too unmannerly. I do not well understand that. Will you play upon this pipe? My lord, I cannot. I pray you. Believe me, I cannot. I do beseech you. I know no touch of it, my lord. Tis as easy as lying. Govern these vintages with your fingers and thumb, give it breath with your mouth, and it will discourse most eloquent music. Look you, these are the stops. But these I cannot command to any utterance of harmony. I have not the skill. Why, look you now. How unworthy a thing you make of me. You would play upon me, you would seem to know my stops, you would pluck out the heart of my mystery. You would sound me from my lowest note to the top of my compass. And there is much music, excellent voice, in this little organ. Yet cannot you make it speak? Splod, do you think I am easier to be played on than a pipe? Call me what instrument you will, though you can fret me, yet you cannot play upon me. Enter Polonius. God bless you, sir. My lord, the queen would speak with you, and presently. Do you see yonder cloud that's almost in shape of a camel? By the mass, and tis like a camel indeed. Methinks it is like a weasel. It is backed like a weasel. Or like a whale. Very like a whale. Then I will come to my mother by and by. They fool me to the top of my bent. I will come by and by. I will say so. By and by is easily said. Exit Polonius. Leave me, friends. Exeunt all but Hamlet. Tis now the very witching time of night, when churchyards yawn and hell itself breathes out contagion to this world. Now could I drink hot blood, and do such bitter business as the day would quake to look on. Soft, now to my mother. O oh, heart, lose not thy nature. Let not ever the soul of Nero enter this firm bosom. Let me be cruel, not unnatural. I will speak daggers to her, but use none. My tongue and soul in this be hypocrites. How in my words soever she be shent, to give them seals never my soul consent. Exit. Scene three. A room in the castle. Enter King Claudius, Rosencrantz, and Guildenstern. I like him not, nor stands it safe with us to let his madness range. Therefore prepare you. I your commission will forthwith dispatch, and he to England shall along with you. The terms of our estate may not endure hazard so dangerous as doth hourly grow out of his lunacies. We will ourselves provide. Most holy and religious fear it is to keep those many, many bodies safe that live and feed upon your majesty. The single and peculiar life is bound, with all the strength and armour of the mind, to keep itself from noise. But much more that spirit upon whose wheel depend and rest the lives of many. The cease of majesty dies not alone, but, like a gulf, doth draw what's near it with it. It is a massy wheel fixed on the summit of the highest mount, to whose huge spokes ten thousand lesser things are mortised and joined, which, when it falls, each small annexment, petty consequence, attends the boisterous ruin. Never alone did the king sigh, but with general groan. Arm you, I pray you, to this speedy voyage, for we will fetters put upon this fear, which now goes too free-footed. We will, we will haste, haste us. Exeunt Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Enter Polonius. My lord, he's going to his mother's closet. Behind the arras I'll convey myself, to hear the process. On warrant she'll tax him home, and, as you said, and wisely was it said, tis meet that some more audience than a mother, since nature makes them partial, should o'erhear the speech of vantage. Fare you well, my liege. I'll call upon you ere you go to bed, and tell you what I know. Thanks, dear my lord. Exit Polonius. 
Oh, my offence is rank! It smells to heaven! It hath the primal eldest curse upon't, a brother's murder. Pray can I not, though inclination be as sharp as will, my stronger guilt defeats my strong intent. And like a man to double business bound, I stand in pause where I shall first begin, and both neglect. What if this cursed hand were thicker than itself with brother's blood? Is there not rain enough in the sweet heavens to wash it white as snow? Whereto serves mercy but to confront the visage of offence? And what's in prayer but this twofold force to be forestalled ere we come to fall, or pardoned being down? Then I'll look up. My fault is past. But, oh, what form of prayer can serve my turn? Forgive me my foul murder? That cannot be, since I am still possessed of those effects for which I did the murder. My crown, mine own ambition, and my queen. May one be pardoned and retain the offence? In the corrupted currents of this world offence's gilded hand may shove by justice, and oft tis seen the wicked prize itself buys out the law. But tis not so above. There is no shuffling, there the action lies in his true nature. And we ourselves compelled even to the teeth and forehead of our faults to give in evidence. What then? What rests? Try what repentance can. What can it not? Yet what can it when one cannot repent? O oh, wretched state! O oh, bosom black as death! O oh, limed soul that struggling to be free art more engaged! Help! Angels, make a say! Bow, stubborn knees, and heart with strings of steel be soft as sinews of the newborn babe. All may be well. Retires and kneels. Enter Hamlet. Now might I do it, Pat. Now he is praying, and now I'll do it. And so he goes to heaven. And so am I revenged. That would be scanned. A villain kills my father, and for that I, his sole son, do this same villain send to heaven. Well, this is higher in salary, not revenge. He took my father grossly, full of bread, with all his crimes broad-blown as flesh as may. And how his audit stands, who knows, save heaven. But in our circumstance and course of thought tis heavy with him. And am I then revenged, to take him in the purging of his soul when he is fit and seasoned for his passage? No. Up, sword, and know thou a more horrid hent. When he is drunk, asleep, or in his rage, or in the incestuous pleasure of his bed, at gaming, swearing, or about some act that has no relish of salvation in it, then trip him, that his heels may kick at heaven, and that his soul may be as damned and black as hell whereto it goes. My mother stays. This physic but prolongs thy sickly days. Exit. Rising. My words fly up, my thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. Exit. Scene four. The Queen's Closet. Enter Queen Gertrude and Polonius. He will come straight. Look, you lay home to him. Tell him his pranks have been too broad to bear with, and that your grace hath screened and stood between much heat in him. I'll sconce me even here. Pray you, be round with him. Within. Mother! 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 I'll warrant you, fear me not. Withdraw. I hear him coming. Polonius hides behind the arras. Enter Hamlet. Now, mother, what's the matter? Hamlet, thou hast thy father much offended. 
Mother, you have my father much offended. Come, come, you answer with an idle tongue. Go, go, you question with a wicked tongue. Why, how now, Hamlet? What's the matter now? Have you forgot me? No, by the rude not so, you are the queen, your husband's brother's wife, and, would it were not so, you are my mother. Nay, then, I'll set those to you that can speak. Come, come, and sit you down. You shall not budge, you go not till I set you up a glass where you may see the inmost part of you. What wilt thou do? Thou wilt not murder me. Help! Help! Ho! Behind. What ho? Help! 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 Drawing. How now? A rat? Dead for a ducat. Dead. Makes a pass through the arras. <sighs> oh, no. Falls and dies. Oh, me, what hast thou done? Nay, I know not. Is it the king? Oh, what a rash and bloody deed is this? A bloody deed. Almost as bad, good mother, as kill a king and marry with his brother. As kill a king? Ay, lady, twas my word. Lifts up the arras and discovers Polonius. Thou wretched, rash, intruding fool. Farewell. I took thee for thy better. Take thy fortune. Thou find'st to be too busy is some danger. Leave wringing of your hands, peace, sit you down, and let me wring your heart. For so I shall, if it be made of penetrable stuff, if damned custom have not brassed it so that it is proof and bulwark against sense. What have I done that thou darest wag thy tongue in noise so rude against me? Such an act that blurs the grace and blush of modesty, calls virtue hypocrite, takes off the rose from the fair forehead of an innocent love and sets a blister there, makes marriage vows as false as dicer's oaths. Oh, such a deed, as from the body of contraction plucks the very soul, and sweet religion makes a rhapsody of words. Heaven's face doth glow, yea, this solidity and compound mass with tristful visage, as against the doom is thought sick at the act. Ah, me, what act that roars so loud and thunders in the index? Look here, upon this picture and on this, the counterfeit presentment of two brothers. See what a grace was seated on this brow, Hyperion's curls, the front of Jove himself, an eye like Mars to threaten and command, a station like the herald Mercury new-lighted on a heaven-kissing hill, a combination and a form indeed, where every god did seem to set his seal to give the world assurance of a man. This was your husband. Look you now what follows. Here is your husband, like a mildewed ear blasting his wholesome brother. Have you eyes? Could you on this fair mountain leave to feed and batten on this moor? Ha! Have you eyes? You cannot call it love, for at your age the heyday in the blood is tame, it's humble and waits upon the judgment, and what judgment would step from this to this? Sense, sure, you have, else could you not have motion, but sure that sense is apoplexed, for madness would not err, nor sense to ecstasy was ne'er so thralled, but it reserved some quantity of choice to serve in such a difference. What devil wast that thus hath cousined you at hoodman blind? Eyes without feeling, feeling without sight, ears without hands or eyes, smelling sans all, or but a sickly part of one true sense could not so mope. O oh, shame, where is thy blush? Rebellious hell! If thou canst mutine in a matron's bones, to flaming youth let virtue be as wax and melt in her own fire. Proclaim no shame when the compulsive ardour gives the charge, since frost itself as actively doth burn, and reason panders will. O oh, Hamlet, speak no more. Thou turnest mine eyes into my very soul, and there I see such black and grained spots as will not leave their tinct. Nay, but to live in the rank sweat of an enseamed bed, stewed in corruption, honeying and making love over the nasty sty. Oh, speak to me no more. These words like daggers enter in mine ears. No more, sweet Hamlet. 
a murderer and a villain, a slave that is not twentieth part the tithe of your precedent lord, a vice of kings, a cut-purse of the empire and the rule that from a shelf the precious diadem stole and put it in his pocket. No more! A king of shreds and patches. Enter ghost. Save me, and hover o'er me with your wings, you heavenly guards. What would your gracious figure? Alas, he's mad. Do not you come your tardy son to chide? That lapsed in time and passion lets go by the important acting of your dread command. Oh, say! Do not forget. This visitation is but to whet thy almost blunted purpose. But look, amazement on thy mother sits. Oh, step between her and her fighting soul. Conceit in weakest bodies, strongest works. Speak to her, Hamlet. How is it with you, lady? Alas, how is it with you, that you do bend your eye on vacancy, and with the incorporal air do hold discourse? Forth at your eyes your spirits wildly peep. And as the sleeping soldiers in the alarm, your bedded hair, like life in excrements, starts up and stands on end. O gentle sun, upon the heat and flame of thy distemper, sprinkle cool patience. Whereon do you look? On him, on him. Look you how pale he glares. His form and cause conjoined, preaching to stones would make them capable. Do not look upon me, lest with this piteous action you convert my stern effects. Then what I have to do will want true color, tears perchance for blood. To whom do you speak this? Do you see nothing there? Nothing at all. Yet all that is I see. Nor did you nothing hear? No, nothing but ourselves. Why, look you there, look how it steals away! My father, in his habit as he lived, look where he goes even now out at the portal. Exit ghost. This the very coinage of your brain, this bodiless creation, ecstasy is very cunning in. Ecstasy? My pulse as yours doth temperately keep time, and makes as healthful music. It is not madness that I have uttered. Bring me to the test, and I the matter will re-word, which madness would gamble from. Mother, for love of grace, lay not that mattering unction to your soul that not your trespass but my madness speaks. It will but skin and film the ulcerous place, whilst rank corruption, mining all within, infects unseen. Confess yourself to heaven. Repent what's past. Avoid what is to come. And do not spread the compost on the weeds to make them rancor. Forgive me this my virtue, for in the fatness of these Percy times, virtue itself of vice must pardon beg, yea, curb and woo for leave to do him good. O oh, Hamlet, thou hast cleft my heart in twain. O oh, throw away the worser part of it, and live the purer with the other half. Good night, but go not to mine uncle's bed. Assume a virtue if you have it not. That monster, custom, who all sense doth eat of habit's devil, is angel yet in this, that to the use of actions fair and good he likewise gives a frock or livery that aptly is put on. Refrain to-night, and that shall lend a kind of easiness to the next abstinence, the next more easy, for use almost can change the stamp of nature, and either shame the devil or throw him out with wondrous potency. Once more, good-night. And when you are desirous to be blessed, I'll blessing beg of you. For this same Lord, pointing to Polonius, I do repent, but heaven hath pleased it so to punish me with this and this with me, that I must be their scourge and minister. I will bestow him, and will answer well the death I gave him. So again, good night. I must be cruel only to be kind. Thus bad begins and worse remains behind. One word more, good lady. What shall I do? Not this by no means that I bid you do. Let the bloat king tempt you again to bed, pinch wanton on your cheek, call you his mouse, and let him, for a pair of reachy kisses or paddling in your neck with his damned fingers, make you to ravel all this matter out. 
that I, essentially, am not in madness, but mad in craft. Twere good you let him know. For who that's but a queen, fair, sober, wise, would from a paddock, from a bat, a gib, such dear concernings hide? Who would do so? No. In despite of sense and secrecy, unpeg the basket on the house's top, let the birds fly, and, like the famous ape, to try conclusions, in the basket creep, and break your own neck down. Be thou assured, if words be made of breath, and breath of life, I have no life to breathe what thou hast said to me. I must to England. You know that. Alack, I had forgot. Tis so concluded on. There's letters sealed, and my two schoolfellows, whom I will trust as I will adders fanged, they bear the mandate. They must sweep my way and marshal me to knavery. Let it work, for tis the sport to have the engineer hoist with his own petard, and shall go hard, but I will delve one yard below their minds and blow them at the moon. Oh, tis most sweet when in one line two crafts directly meet. This man shall set me packing. I'll lug the guts into the neighbor room. Mother, good night. Indeed, this counsellor is now most still, most secret, and most grave, who was in life a foolish, prating knave. Come, sir, to draw toward an end with you. Good night, mother. Exeunt severally. Hamlet dragging in Polonius. End of Act Three.